let's see if we can get terminals, which is file three up, and then I'm going to read a little bit about it. Um, I, I'm wanting to see how much about it is on the screen itself. It was running before. I hear the pleasant whirring sound. Always good. Same thing. Same start up the screen. Okay. The hundred records which make up the story I'm, I'm, are selected at random by the computer. The information is stored in computer re memory and retrieved at random in the same way it comes and goes in the narrator's mind. Sometimes one record will be repeated several times, or one part of the story will be submerged for a long time, reoccurring unexpectedly. After each record, you can decide whether to see another record or not. When prompted, type stop to stop, or type return to return. And this is a sim essentially a very similar program to the program I used for its name was Penelope. And um, this file is also interested, interesting from a historical point of view. In the first two top files, it's the chip industry. In the third file, a narrator, Jenny, Jenny, has gone to work for a word, doing word processing. And she's in one of those big rooms where everybody had a word processor. So interspersed with her memories are the actual using of early word processors. Okay, so all we do here is we just keep pressing return. And I have no idea what we're going to get. Because it's all, these, every time you press return, the computer, um, essentially the program I wrote, chooses a number and each of these is numbered. That's how it worked. So I had a hundred records and number from one to a hundred. I had a program that had the computer choose a number fairly easy to write. And then that number was translated into a file name, which is very easy because the file name was one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> it was a pretty easy program um, to put together, actually, but very effective. In the room where I work, there were about 20 de desks called stations. A computer takes up most of the space at each station. Each computer has a black screen which rests on a gray case and a keyboard which is attached to the computer by a cord like those cords which hold the two pieces of telephones together. They call the computers terminals. It's January in San Francisco. Through the windows that run along the east side of the big room where I work as a word processor for a market research firm, I can see that the sun is shining outside. Let's stick to the records that come up with the um, word processing if I can, although I can't read this one anyhow because it's too long. So I'm just going to press return. You can always do that when you're reading it anyhow, like flipping pages essentially. Ah, we are at another party. This is the Christmas party at the um, Broadtoe's home. Puffy was up on the table licking eggnog out of a big silver bowl. Plastic glasses and little red and green napkins were spread out around her feet. The idea of this was that if you're sitting in such a room, one of those big rooms with lots of computers, you're going to be thinking all kinds of things. And uh, sometimes they come and go in your mind, sometimes they repeat. The lunchroom was a small rectangular room with no windows. There was a sink and a counter with a Mr. Coffee machine at one end of the room. At the other end, there was a refrigerator and a small table with a microwave oven sitting on it. Most of the women who worked in the big room where I worked ate their lunch in the lunchroom. They kept frozen TVs in the freezer compartment of the refrigerator 
And at lunchtime, they heated them up in the microwave and set them around the table and ate them. Through the old glass brick windows, I could see the strip of grass across from the apartment building where I lived in San Francisco, not far from Golden Gate Park. All day, every, all day long, every day, a black man sat at the picnic table there, eating potato chips and drinking Coca-Cola. He had a false leg, and sometimes he took it off and laid it on the picnic table. I dreamed I was wearing a white lab coat in a large room with concrete walls and long rows of silver and plexiglass machinery. About 20 other women wearing white lab coats were moving slowly around the room. In the center of the room, there was a circular glass bin about six feet high. It was filled with several thousand chips. I walked over to the bin and looked in. Inside, giant blades like those in a blender were moving slowly, grinding the chips into small powdery pieces. The Christmas tree, a hemlock with fine black needles, was so big that it almost touched the ceiling. It hadn't been decorated yet. At its base were the old brown boxes in which my mother stored the ornaments. The boxes were open, but each ornament was still wrapped in paper towel. My brother was standing at the doorway, looking at me. going to try to get back to the office. But you have no idea what's going to happen here. And this work had some influence, influence on what I did with the Penelope program, because those memories are too disjointed. And if you recall, in the Penelope program, I, I came up with five da separate databases instead of just one. So the, the reader moved between more related memories, which, which is a little bit more realistic, realistic than what happens here, or not, well, not necessarily. <laughs> okay, we, we have a repeat. David was sleeping on the floor of his friend's Robert's studio in Emeryville. The walls were covered with photographs of men in baseball caps. Above me, a man wearing a white baseball cap was eating a piece of lemon pie. Across the cap's visor, visor there was a picture of blue syrup and an orange sunset with the words Hawaii written in black water 